back, the recording has started. So um, with that, Lisa, take it away. Great. Thank you, Sarah and Heather. Um, as they both had said, my name is Lisa Brown. I'm an early literacy coaching consultant in the Office of Field Services Special Populations Unit um, at the Michigan Department of Education. And I um, have been supporting with the early literacy um, initiative at the department. And I also support with the multi-tiered systems of support work that's happening there as well. Um, thanks so much for joining us today to talk about planning for third grade literacy success in the context of the third grade reading law. My hope is that at the end of this webinar, um, that you all will understand how focusing on literacy is necessary for Michigan to achieve top 10 and 10. Um, get a nice overview of the third grade reading law and um, understand really your roles and responsibilities in navigating the law, moving from not only the compliance, but really a commitment to literacy. And then um, feel as though you have some supports as you move forward with uh, literacy in your districts. So as many of you may know, Michigan is um, moving toward becoming a top 10 and 10 state. We have um, a state strategic plan that consists of seven goals um, and 44 strategies. And really it encompasses uh, learning centered supports, creating an effective education workforce and building strategic partnerships while um, also building a systemic infrastructure. And these are the seven goals and I've highlighted for you actually starred one, two, three, five, and seven. Um, while I think all of these uh, goals support early literacy, the four that are starred there, I think are a little bit more explicit. And you can learn more about the top 10 and 10 by visiting the MDE website. So before we get really engulfed in um, the logistics of the legislation, I wanna provide a little bit of information about um, what really has been happening with the Early Literacy Initiative and how we kind of have gotten to the place where we're at today. So in 2015, the governor formed a work group and the work group were, uh, produced a report with four big recommendations. So the recommendations were aligned with um, determining assessments to support literacy, educator training, as well as how to engage parents. And then it also really encompassed um, looking at data and um, provided a vision for where Michigan wanted to be regarding literacy. Around the same time that that was happening, um, there was this third grade retention bill that hadn't quite been passed yet. Um, and while that was still a bill, based on the governor's work group, the legislator decided to put for some money. Um, they looked at the work group report and they said, we're gonna take these recommendations and we're gonna support this state by providing some um, funding, right? So the funding um, consisted of initially $3 million for early literacy coaches that would go to ISDs, another $1.9 million for um, some professional learning, which I'll talk to you a little bit about as we move on in the presentation, and then some money in the form of grants that would go directly to districts uh, called the Additional Instructional Time Grant, and then also um, a set of funding that was combined with another section of state aid to provide some assessment reimbursement um, opportunities. So later on, that third grade retention bill became law. And you'll see that um, since this was passed in 2016, I've kind of made a little notation there to say that the retention portion really affects this year's um, first graders, which would have been last year's kindergartners. And then also in our state, which I think is important to note, is that the governor has appointed a third, um, I'm sorry, a pre-K-12 literacy commission 
um, and that is head by Amanda Price, a former legislator. And we have um, Dr. Sean Kotke, an MDE uh, staff on that team as well, um, supporting with that work. And that group is formed of um, those who were appointed um, by individuals all throughout the state. And they're really focusing on helping to further drive the literacy supports in Michigan. So I want to start out by, um, well, moving forward rather, by sharing some data with you. This is a little difficult to see, um, but this is based on fourth grade NAEP data. So NAEP is an assessment that allows states um, to compare with other states. And you'll see here that um, Michigan is in this bottom left-hand quadrant for both low performing and low improving um, in early reading. And that's kind of a big bummer, right? Because um, historically, Michigan has really been a leader. Um, and so we're looking at you know, various reasons of, of why this could be. I think um, you could argue a lot of reasons. I think Michigan looks um, very different than it has even five years ago. Um, nonetheless, there is some additional data here that kind of captures some of the, the same um, trends. So we're seeing a slight decrease um, according to the M stop here. So again, these are all things that um, the governor's work group looked at also you know our legislator is very familiar with this data and I think more so than not the reason for presenting this to you is just to really provide the context of why in the world we might have some legislation that looks very different than legislation in the past so as we move forward to looking at um, early literacy I want to bring your attention to some resources that are available they're called the essential instructional practices and there are several different documents um, these documents were created by the early literacy task force who have all of these um, partners that you can see on your screen and basically, this task force, which is a subgroup of the General Education Leadership Network, got together and said, okay, based on the governor's work group and also looking at the data, we need to do something to help support students um, in the state. And again, they came up with a series of instructional practices, coaching practices, practices to support school-wide and center-based programs, um, and the, the instructional practices are designed for pre-K, K, K-3, uh, 4, 5, and they're currently working on a 6, 8 document. And we also have a set of coaching practices too. And I love this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So really, um, the, this work that came out of this group has been extremely valuable in helping um, put together some tangible things in the in the classroom regarding or uh, for supporting literacy. So the early literacy task force produced some of these documents. And then um, they said, you know what, we want to make it known for, for all of those throughout the state to really understand our intent and purpose for supporting with early literacy. So they developed this um, literacy theory of action. And if you look all the way over to the right, the purpose here um, is to ensure that every child develops strong literacy knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And we're going to do that by ensuring that these research supported practices are in every classroom, supporting every child every day. And we're going to ensure that by supporting teachers and developing their instructional skills through their involvement with coaching and professional learning. 
and we're going to support administrators and other um, leaders around literacy. And in order to get there, we need to ensure that we're aligning policies, funding, and resources. So again, there's quite a bit that's happening around early literacy. So here are the practices. This is a huge part um, the liter of the literacy work. These are all free and they're available on the GELN website and you can also um, go to MDE's website. And they can be used with any uh, literacy program that you have. But again, this is where we see where instruction aligns to um, research. And again, this is where we're talking about building um, capacity and this really is in support of the theory of action as well. So what is happening um, in the state regarding professional learning? Because you saw that 35A funding, earlier we talked a little bit about professional learning. So this graphic, and I'm not gonna go too much into detail, but um, keep your eye out because we do offer, in partnership with MESA, um, we've offered a couple of free coaching institutes. And they're really designed to support coaches with the implementation of the essentials. Again, strengthening that research into practice. So we've looked at the data and we know Michigan is faced with a challenge. This is a quote from the essential practices. And we know that classroom instruction can have an enormous impact on the development of literacy skills. Dr. Nell Duke from the um, University of Michigan has been one of the researchers that has been um, leading with this message. So we know that we need to do some things differently um, in the state right now. And some of those things might be a little bit uncomfortable. And helping to align the research will support with that. So let's get into the kind of the nitty gritty of the third grade reading law. And as we navigate this, just know that there are supports that are available. Um, and I'll talk more about those. So beginning in the 2017-2018 school year, these are all of the things that need to happen. And um, the way that this PowerPoint is laid out is I'll highlight each one of these sections and then have uh, a portion designated to sort of explaining each one of these. So beginning the 2017-2018 school year for all K-3 students, including young fives, students need to be administered um, an initial assessment within the first 30 days of school, and they need to participate in the assessment system at least three times per school year, knowing that formative assessment is ongoing and continuous. So the um, districts will use their assessment system to identify um, reading deficiencies and support students in those areas. So we have a list of the assessments on the MDE website, and I'm sure many of you have already identified what your initial assessment is going to be, what your extensive assessment is going to be, and um, have been providing those to students and finding out their areas of need. In addition to those lists, it's really important to use, to look at the guidance. So I've included that here. So it's not just that MDE put out some lists, um, but there's some guidance on, on how to think about because districts have the choice of what assessments that they will use ultimately within those lists. I also want to say that you're not, um, those aren't the only assessments that you can use, but that will meet the minimum compliance of the law. So districts should use the most current versions of assessments. 
and also provide those that are administering the assessments with appropriate training. We also want to make sure that the data that we are collecting, that we're using, and this, the data from the assessments on the list should be combined with the formative data, including observation, um, peer and self-reflection, and instructional evaluation of student performance. And districts should consider choosing assessments that align with the task and rigor of the current state summative assessment for ELA. There's a link on here that will take you to the MSTEP resource page to learn more about the um, text complexity, see some sample items, et cetera. And districts should also create an appropriate local assessment system. And there's some more tools here linked out. A district assessment inventory website that will help um, districts determine what current assessments they are using um, and what those assessments are used for. And then this talks about how not just a single assessment will predict um, how well students will perform on the state summative assessment. You should use multiple assessments, including formative practices. Is there any questions at this point? Everybody good? So far, does anybody have any uh, questions at this point? If you do, feel free to use the, tr the chat window. So the next part of the law that has been a focus is this idea of core reading instruction. So having a core reading program um, intends to ensure all students are reading at grade level by the end of grade three. So the, the program should address um, the instruction that needs to happen for the reading deficiencies, uh, screen and monitor the progress of reading skills, be comprehensive evidence-based, um, and provide core instruction. And this has really caused a lot of confusion in the state. So what is a program? It's a plan or system, according to Merriam-Webster, which action may be taken toward a goal. So one of the messaging that we've had around this is that your reading program consists of multiple pieces. It includes your assessment, it includes the instructional practices, it includes a scope and sequence um, that makes sense for literacy development. So again, here are the practices, because these can be infused um, with any resource that you have um, and should be part of instruction for every uh, child, every classroom, every day. Here are some more resources that may be part of your program. These are all based on research. So from the What Works Clearinghouse, um, also from CCSSO, and Nell Duke has a, not this, but that series. These are very short reads that are great book studies that really um, focus on supporting the essentials. These are all linked out. Now created a dif uh, differentiated literacy instruction model for us to show that um, the green area is tier one instruction where we should be supporting, you know, 80% at least of our students and that those other areas, tier two and tier three, are in addition to that core instruction for students that need um, more support. Lisa, there's been a question yeah. that the resources that you're highlighting in this PowerPoint, are these on the MDE website? Um, that's a good question. I think some of them are, but not all of them. Okay. But they are linked out on this PowerPoint. Okay. So the, the PowerPoint that we'll be sending out afterwards, or I should say the PDF yeah. version of the PowerPoint, will have links to all of these, so you can mm -hmm. click on the graphic and it will right. take them out to the resource. And if for some reason we can't get it linked in the PDF, I'll just put, we can put it directly in the email. Perfect. So
So um, for those who have higher populations or English, of English language learners or not, here are some more resources to support. We've talked about um, the essential instructional practices. The department is working on um, a document to even take the essential instructional practices a little bit deeper um, in relation to um, supporting English learners. So this companion document should be available soon, um, again, to kind of be a little bit more explicit on the needs for English learners. We are a WIDA state, so any um, school receiving uh, public funds um, and has English learners would be assessing students, um, English learners with the WIDA assessment. And so in addition to that assessment, there are tons of resources available um, on the WIDA website. And again, this book, No More Low Expectations for English Learners, a nice short read from Nell's Not This But That series. So hopefully this captures the gist of um, pieces that you might want to incorporate into your professional learning or um, also just your overall literacy program. So section three of the third grade reading law focuses on reading intervention. Um, and I was just sharing with Heather and Sarah earlier that this is kind of a bulky section of the law. Um, so if you would like, feel free to um, open up in another window that link out to the third grade reading law. And if you scroll down to section three, you'll be able to follow along a little bit more. Basically what this section talks about is the purpose of the interventions is to develop the ability to read at grade level by the end of grade three. And in, in the law, section 3A, after that it says some or all of the parts, so I through um, one through seven. So I've linked it out here to say, you don't have to do all of those things, but you need to be thinking about what do students need within that scope. Um, so some of the questions that I get around that are, how am I going to do all of these things, right? So it may not be necessary, and we also don't want to um, be per, like over, over intervening, right? Or over interventioning, um, if that's even a word, to students who may not need those interventions. So use your assessment system to determine the needs of the students and then support from there. The law calls out specifically interventions for English learners. And some of these look more like best instructional practices than um, interventions. For example, modeling, guided practice, and comprehensible input are all parts of um, the sheltered instruction observational protocol. And then if you have the resources available, um, feel free to support with instruction in the student's native language um, and offer feedback in native language. So back to the differentiated literacy model. Regardless of intervention, children's engagement is a top priority. Um, and instruction should be responsive. The child should have a considerable time um, to apply what is being learned during reading writing instruction. So this is really, again, we're not going to intervene our way out of the situation that we're at. Focusing on core instruction um, in line with the practices is going to make a huge difference. Next hack topic is the reading improvement lands, also known as the IRIPs. So beginning the 2017-2018 school year, all students exhibiting a reading deficiency at any time using the district assessment system need to have an individual reading improvement plan. They also need to provide parents with written um, notice of the deficiency. And that needs to happen within 30 days of identifying the deficiency. So the gist here is what do our students need Let's communicate with the parents to let them know, thinking back to that governor's initial work group report, remember, wanting to engage the parents in the process. So let's collaborate with them, bring them in as, part, as a partner in supporting the student, 
and then putting those structures in, in place. Does anyone have any questions about the individual reading improvement plans? The next portion of the law talks about professional development. So here we have principles specifically called out in this legislation as being the leaders on determining what um, professional development should be. I'm super excited to announce some of these free resources that we have to support with the essential instructional practices as well as what coaching could look like. So if you um, go to the literacyessentials.org website, the introduction in module one of the K3 essential instructional practices are available. And what you're gonna see there is live video of Michigan classrooms with real teachers um, in real situations using research supported practices to um, instruct students. And these documents are really great because they can be used in professional learning communities and partnership with your district or ISD coaches, um, grade level team meetings to really bring us back to um, looking at the research supported literacy practices. And they're all free and provided through that grant that the legislators gave us in that professional learning section. So coaching modules three and four will be coming out and we'll be doing a gradual release, like a staggered release for the arrest of the K3 essential modules. And there will be pre-K modules for those who have um, early childhood um, or preschool or Head Start programs at their buildings. So literacy coaching. Beginning the 2017-2018 school year, um, what we have is um, districts will need to utilize uh, at the minimum early literacy coaches provided through the ISDs. So all intermediate school districts right now, with the exception of Sanilac, has hired one or more early literacy coaches. And they've um, done that through the, um, it's now up to $6 million that have been um, allocated through the legislator. It requires the ISD to make um, a 50% match um, but those, those coaches are available at that intermediate school district. If PSAs would like to otherwise use their own coaches, they're more than welcome to do that, um, hire their own, but it needs to be in line with Section 1B of the law. So the, the law uh, has a, a pretty large section for what um, the responsibilities of a coach. So if PSAs are interested in, in supporting there on their own, that is an opportunity. We're currently working on um, getting our coaching model that we developed with stakeholders out um, through communication for districts. And this is kind of a sneak peek. This is based off the essential coaching practices through the Early Literacy Task Force, um, the subgroup of GELN. We had the opportunity to work with Dr. Susan Lally. And this is just a graphic that shows that coaching should be supported by administrators within a multi-year initiative. And that at the building level, the bulk of the coaches work should be in the context of working with teachers, coaches, and other literacy leaders, conferencing, modeling, applying assessment literacy, observing and co-planning, and that coaches may also serve as literacy leaders. Um, could be committee member, presenter, facilitator, liaison, or mentor. And that the qualifications are also an um, important foundation. So coaches should have specialized literacy knowledge and skills, understand how to work with other adults, um, and be, be good at um, building collaborative relationships. And again, this aligns to what research says about um, literacy coaching 
in the elementary. So another part of the law that calls out is that districts are encouraged to offer summer reading camps. So this is another book from Nell's Not This But That series, No More Summer Reading Loss. Our early literacy coaches at the ISD have spent a lot of time thinking about how they can support districts in building strong um, summer reading programs. So we did a webinar um, with Dr. Jimmy Kim and offered that up to um, the ISD coaches. I think we have a link out to that too. But again, um, really it's about building that culture of knowing that reading just doesn't happen through during the school year, right? We're building a culture of reading that's happening um, as just part of your life, um, something that you do no matter when school is in session or not. In the last part, my probably most unfavorite part to discuss is the retention aspect of, um, of the law. So what are the implications for third graders? Okay. So we talked a little bit about reading interventions earlier for um, any student in grade K-3. Now for third graders, um, there are some specific things that need to happen. So if you have a student that's exhibiting a reading deficiency in third grade, um, all of these things that are bulleted here are things that need to be happening. I'll let you take a minute to read those. Beginning in the 2019-2020 school year, um, this is when the retention portion of the law goes into effect. And basically this says, um, district shall ensure that a pupil whose guardian has been provided notification, and we'll talk about notification in a little bit, is not enrolled in grade four until one of the following occurs. So the student can enroll in grade four if they achieve a reading score that is less than one grade level behind on the state summative assessment. Um, this determination of what does it mean to be one grade level behind, if you know anything about the M step, you know that's not how it's uh, reported right now. So we have some work at the department to um, come up with what that looks like. Also, um, demonstrate a grade three reading level through performance on an alternative standard reading assessment approved by our state superintendent. Um, we have not had conversations at this time about what that looks like. And then you can also demonstrate a grade through uh, three reading level through a portfolio which would capture um, student success or um, proficiency in all of the state grade three ELA um, standards. Transfer students younger than um, 10 years old must demonstrate grade three, must demonstrate a grade three reading level. And unlike other um, laws in other states around third grade re reading, Michigan doesn't require students to um, repeat grades more than once. It just says um, retention in grade three. So we talked a little bit about timeline earlier, and I said I would come back to that. So parents will receive a letter from CEPI um, after they take the state summative assessment. And basically, that letter will notify parents um, that the student was not uh, was more than one grade level behind on the state summative assessment. 
in that that student may be required to be retained. Now, I want to emphasize the may be because while the letter signals, it doesn't require the retention. That's a district decision. Okay? It's a district decision on whether or not the student will be retained. So this letter is going to flag the parents. Was there a question? Yeah, yeah. there is. It's about the May 23rd and the June 1st date. Yeah. Is that of 2020? Yes. Okay. So anybody living with the um, who's received MSTEP scores know this is like a super tight timeline. Um, and I would say that when I present, um, this is a big sticking point for those that are in schools because it means a lot of different things. So I'm interested to see how this is um, going to roll out. And I imagine that there will be further discussions about this timeline and the logistics of it. So CBD. So a guardian has a right to request a good cause exemption. We're gonna talk about good cause exemptions. The good cause exemptions must happen at least 30 days after the notification from CEPI. And the parent must request or direct the request to the district in which the student intends to enroll in fourth grade. And the um, parent also has a right to request a meeting with school officials. So what does this mean for schools? This means that schools are going to really need to think deeply about their communication with parents, um, as well as in to ensure that there is a process for this procedure that's going to happen at the district level. So what is a good cause exemption? So a good cause exemption, which would mean you're requesting that the student not be retained based on this criteria, may be granted for one of the following. If a student has an individual education um, plan, an IEP, or a 504, that may be grounds for the students um, not to be retained. If a student is an English learner with less than three years of instruction, that can also be a reason for a student not to be retained. If they received intensive intervention for two or more years and have been previously retained, that may be a reason for a good cause exemption. If they um, have been enrolled in the district for less than two years, and they haven't, um, there is no evidence of an IRIP that may be um, cause for good cause exemption. Or if it's requested within the time period and in the best interest of the student. So after the parent request or at the teacher's own initiative, so the parent can request the good cause exemption or the teacher can request the good cause exemption. Um, the grade three teacher will submit a recommendation along with whatever documentation is needed that indicates that the exemption applies to the student. There will be a review process and the recommendation will be made in writing at the district level. And then the superintendent or chief administrator has the final say. And then it needs to be communicated to the parent or legal guardian within 30 days before the school year starts. Like I said, it's a pretty tight timeline. So besides a good cause exemption, there's um, there's some um, other exemptions. So both of the following. If a student is proficient in all subject areas, um, assessed on the uh, state three, I'm sorry, grade three state assessment, so that would be math. And if they um, show proficiency in science and social studies through a portfolio, that can be another reason for an exemption. So what happens to those students who are not who um, are not promoted, and then what happens to those 
who have been promoted based on a good cause exemption. So those students still need support, um, and they should still be provided reading intervention to support with the deficiency. So you may have some third graders and now some fourth graders that are needing supports. And also, they need to be assigned to a highly effective teacher of reading, the highest evaluated grade three teacher in the school, or reading specialist. And this goes back to that evidence-based reading program. So there needs to be um, an evidence-based reading program for that student. And also um, opportunities for the student to be supported with grade four standards in other areas. Intervention with progress monitoring and um, a read at home plan. I had a question from one of our participants um, about what and how this, the scores would be reported. Um, she asks, when scores are reported out, will there be a better system for disseminating information to the school level? Will there be, uh, we're, uh, sorry, will they be able to specifically see where the breakdown happened with students who didn't pass? Um, so it sounds like they're talking about the current score reports for the MSTEP assessments. I'm assuming that that's what they're talking about, yeah. yes. Um, I honestly am not 100% sure, but I know that this um, data reporting is, is, a, is always a topic of conversation. Um, if you have specific feedback and what you'd like to see on those MSTEP reports, we certainly can give that feedback to the assessment office. Um, but I think, you know, as our state assessment evolves, I mean, we've already had some changes. I think we're going to learn more about what that looks like moving forward. So if districts aren't able to um, support with the um, staffing items outlined earlier, beginning June 4th of the 2019 school year, districts will need to post a plan. And this just outlines the plan. The last piece is about reporting requirements. There is a piece in the legislation that talks about um, a retention report to SEPI. So this is all that it asks for. Um, beginning in 2020, districts will need to report the numbers of pupils retained in grade three and the number of um, pupils promoted to grade four due to a good cause exemption. And that's all that it says about reporting. And at this time, I'm happy to take any questions. You can't see this, but um, our, our names do link out to um, our contact information. But if you want to write this down, my contact information is brownl30 at michigan.gov. Um, and I also placed a, co a colleague of mine, Laurel Treble. She's in um, curriculum instruction. We do a lot of work together in supporting the early literacy initiative, and she can answer any questions at, um, well. So her information is um, treblel at michigan.gov. So last name, first initial, and I happen to have a number 30 next to my name because it's a very common name. There is a question. Is the state going to provide safeguards for districts who may be retaining students? Yeah. Um, we have an FAQ that talks about safeguards, and from my understanding, I haven't heard anything at the state level. Okay. Um, but I know some districts are talking about that at the district level. We can also add the FAQ to the follow-up email too. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, follow-up question of why not? Uh, why not as far as uh, there aren't safeguards? Uh, what do they mean by safeguards? Um, I'm going to unmute uh, that person, and that way they can uh, explain a little bit more. Yeah. 
Uh, Carrie, if you can you um, explain a little bit more about your question? Sure. Um, the state is requiring us to retain students, so I was just wondering if they were going to provide safe safeguards for the districts who may have to retain them. I mean, it's a state law, so I figured the state may be providing would be providing safeguards for the districts. Yeah, I have not heard anything about that, but I certainly can go back and and check and inquire. Okay. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And then we had another question. Um, how does the uh, approved ESSA plan tie in or work with this law? Um, I think, like I had mentioned before, literacy is all over in our state plan. So um, everything in our plan is strategic in supporting Michigan to move forward. And um, all of the information in there on subgroups too aligns with the literacy mission and vision. So everything's aligned. Yeah. Already. Okay. And I think you know districts as they operationalize that plan at the local level can um, think locally about how to strengthen those areas that need to be strengthened in their local levels um, within their their. Uh, local plans as well. Let's see if I can get an answer here. Are there additional questions, Sarah? It doesn't look like there are right now. I'm just making sure that there isn't a follow-up question about um, anything that was asked before, so. Well, we'll just wait a second here, make sure there's no more questions. And if if there's not any more questions, we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, to, to summarize uh, what Sarah had said in the beginning, and then Lisa also alluded to, we will be following up with everybody that signed up for the webinar. Is there another question? Okay. Uh, we will be following up with an email to everybody that uh, signed up, and it will include um, the link for the law, the PowerPoint in a PDF format. Um, we'll also include a link to the, because we did tape this webinar as well, in case you want to share it with somebody else. Uh, we'll include the actual contact information just to make sure that you have that at your fingertips if you uh, would like to get a hold of Lisa as well as the FAQ document that she referenced as well. So we'll make sure we put that all in an email to you and, and you have all of that right in your finger, at your fingertips. Um, again, we'd like to thank Lisa for coming and joining us today and uh, appreciate all of the support that uh, you're giving charter schools and um, look forward to continuing to work with you down the road. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording and we'll be um, closing down the meeting here in just a few moments.